Hey guys, this is Kriven Gavinder from the Gut Health Gurus podcast. I'm a food scientist and my colleague here, James Shedrack, is all things psychology with a psychology background. And today we have a very special guest, Dr. Jason Horlack. Jason, certainly in Australia, is one of the, the most, I guess, credentialed speaker, educator when it comes to the field of the the gut microbiome, probiotics, and gut health. Jason, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you for the invitation to take part. Um, I always enjoy chatting about the gut and microbiome related topics, so I think we'll have a, a fun discussion today. Awesome. Jason, I'm so appreciative for you joining the show. I know we're both crook at the moment, so audience members, please excuse the croaky voices and maybe a, a potential break here and there to have a sip of water and a bit of honey tea. Yes. Yeah, yeah. no, I had two days of being very unwell and two days with patients last, last weekend. So my voice is at that, that breaking point, much more husky than normal. And that's really interesting, Jason. Like, to, I guess the two of us who are really focused on you know, the health space, the wellness, you know, at times when we can get stressed out, maybe it's a lack of sleep, lack of, lack of sleep, um, a bit of work stress, and, and sometimes, yeah. you know, you can get hit by these, these illnesses and, and it's perfectly normal. Yeah, yeah, it, it, I think it totally is. Um, and I think sometimes it's an enforced break because I tried to sit here and work on Monday and my head, head was nodding down, my eyes couldn't stay open. I'm like, okay, no, I actually need to take some hours off and go have a nap. And I just generally don't do that. Um, and it's also what I, what I found through, through my... Um, student life and post student life as you go through these periods of, of very stressful workload and then when you get to the end of a project um that's often when you fall ill i uh, often had that at the end of, of term at, at university where you cram for exams you get everything done and then you get over the finish line and then you just fall over and get ill and that was part of that potential recovery phase <laughs> so for me i've had that sort of year so it's nice to perhaps see this as at the end of the the race <laughs> recovery phase some enforced time off Totally, totally. I could not agree more, Jason. At times we get really busy, we overexert ourselves, you know, and sometimes the body just says, hey, Jason, Ribbon, stop, <laughs> have a break, and let me, let me do my job and, and keep you fit and healthy and going. So sometimes those forced breaks are a very good thing. So, Jason. Yeah, for some, some of us, that's the only breaks we get because <laughs> we have a very hard time mandating or creating break spaces. Yes, agreed. Totally. So, Jason, today, just to set the scene for our audience, so we'll have a, a conversation on, I guess, the microbiome. We'll delve into general gut health, probiotics, prebiotics, and anything that's piquing your interest at the moment in terms of that gut health, probiotics, microbiome space. So just to set the scene for the audience, I've seen some figures recently where it's, and fact check me if I'm, if I'm wrong, Jason, that approximately 10 million Australians suffer from some form of digestive discomfort. So that's, you know, that's almost half a population. Now, just, just to kick things off, why do you think that's the case, Jason? Ah, that's good questions. And I, and I think inevitably there's going to be, you know, um, a number of involved factors that are involved with that. I mean, you'd go, you know, the Western diet, Typical Australian diet or sad, sad diet undoubtedly is, is a contributing factor to that. Uh, I think high stress loads and lack of sleep, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. as we just touched on, I think are contributing factors to that too. Um, and, and then medication use too. And, and I think you can take a step back and go, okay, what all those factors arguably negatively impact the gut microbiota, you know? certain medications do like antibiotics and proton pump inhibitors and non steroidal anti-inflammatories, all of which are widely used by Australians at this time point. Most Australians aren't really eating all that well. <laughs> you know, sometimes we live in bubbles and, you know, all my close colleagues that I, that I, that I see on a daily basis, they eat really well. But then I go down to the local supermarket and I can see what the, the typical Australians eating. And it's quite a different story. It's their, their shopping trolley is filled with, cans of coca-cola um and white processed foods and it's just like ah oh, that's what they no wonder their gut isn't going well no wonder they're not going well more broadly from a metabolic standpoint either um 
So I think it's a combination of those things. And never mind taking even a further step back, going back to the early early childhood history of you know C-section birth and formula feeding, uh, early antibiotic exposure, all of which impacts um, you know gut gut microbiota composition um, and, and in those early windows, you know essentially permanently, which I think does preclude to certain you know, digestive and other uh, metabolic diseases for, for, from that time onwards, which is where the research is now teasing out. So if someone, so you mentioned the word gut microbiota or microbiome. So for someone that's never heard of this concept before, what is the, what is the microbiota? What is the microbiome? Yeah, it's what's been interesting for me as, as a researcher who's been in this field for 18 years is that understanding of those terms is now far more widespread than before. You know, you, you go back 17, 18 years ago, uh, the term microflora was used and very few people were paying much attention to, to gut bacteria. Um, and, and very few people were familiar with the term and familiar with the term probiotics or prebiotics. People just called it acidophilus. At that point, had no idea what prebiotics were. Um, you know, so, so thankfully that message has, has really changed and, and got out into the community. Now, microbiota is, is the organisms that make up the, um, a certain environment. And, and obviously we're talking about the gut microbiota, we're talking about the gut, the microbes that make up our gastrointestinal tract, but primarily we're talking about the microbes that, that reside in our colon. Um, it's the, the clonic microbiota that we're assessing with so stool sampling, where the numbers in the colon far, far outweigh numbers of microbes anywhere else in the gut. Transit time is far slower, so there's a lot of chance for those microbes and their pr products and byproducts to interact with, with you know, our, the human cells and gut cells and immune cells um, in a way that, that sort of um, can alter, alters function of, of those, those cells or that, that organ in terms of the colon, for example. So, um, and microbiome tends to incorporate all of those you know, microbes, but also their, their genetic capacity of what they can actually do as well. Mm -hmm. And so, in terms of the, the microbiome composition, there's a couple of things I want to dig into. So you mentioned testing as one. Yep. So there's options now for people to have tests done. And so, which is brilliant. <laughs> like, I absolutely love that. As, as as I said, I've been in the field for so long that we had to make do um, as clinicians and as as the general public with with suboptimal tools for a long time. Um, you couldn't really get a good feel for for what what was going on in your your gut when we were relying on culturing, for for example. So it's it's been revolutionary um, as as a clinician um, working with patients over the last five years, where we've actually had access to tools to properly assess the ecosystem, and the diversity, and the number of species that are present, etc. So someone someone gets a a stool a stool report. So the options are they can discuss it with their clinician who's versed in this field. Or some people are citizen scientists and maybe they want to test themselves and have a look. So how do they interpret these reports? I think it, it's actually, it's tricky because it's complex. It's, it's not a simple area. I mean, each individual person might have 160 different species present. A number of those species um, have only been recently discovered and scientists don't know what they do <laughs> yet or what a normal amount of that population is. So how can non-scientists have any, any you know, interaction with, with that, the unknowable at this, this time point? So I think that really complicates it. And even the stuff that we do know is still complicated too because we might know, you know a number of, of key genera and make it some markers that we associate with, with key microbiota health like diversity. Um, but I still think it can be challenging area for even clinicians with a background of reading scientific studies to navigate, um, which I can say from experience of observing people around me, um, let alone for the, for the general public, it doesn't mean that they should do the tests and engage and start doing it because I think it, it creates that motivation to learn, motivation to take care and nurture that environment. And I think that's a wonderful thing because it has been a very much neglected um, ecosystem that people have inadvertently trashed <laughs> for, for, for potentially early, the 20 odd years of earlier life or their entire life up to the point that they realize that it's important, they do a test and then that actually can really change the way they interact with that. You know, um, I run workshops for the general public for that, that reason is to help people engage with what we do know about that ecosystem and um, 
it's in, in five years time those workshops will run for far, far longer because we'll, we'll know far more about the different species and what we do now and how to interact and change those things so you know we've got you know, some of the research on the microbiota goes back to 1960s and 70s, um, but it's really the, the evolution of technology in the, that really took place in the early 2000s where we moved to using you know, DNA technology to assess what's there, that the microbiota research has just skyrocketed in terms of the amount that's been done and, and how, how much detail we can see the changes. Because before that, it was pretty hard when we were using culturing. Researchers were looking at, at you know, vegetarian diets versus high meat diets and they couldn't see that it made any difference on the gut, gut bacterial populations. And this was perplexing because it's like, it should, <laughs> but it just didn't seem to. And it led to other researchers to start postulating that, hey, I think what we're using is just too crude. These instruments we're using are too crude to actually see the changes that are occurring. And that's exactly what it was. And you, you fast forward 10 years of using DNA techniques, it's like, oh, now we can see the impact of different dietary approaches, of different medications, uh, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, a whole range of things that we couldn't necessarily easily see before. And, and also the, how long lasting they are. Like we used to think antibiotics impacted the ecosystem health for you know, two weeks or three weeks or four weeks. Then it would look like, like it did before when we used culturing. And now we start using DNA tools. It's like, hold on, it doesn't look <laughs> the same as it did before. Certain species do, they bounce back. Certain species are advantaged by the antibiotic exposure if they have the right genes. Um, but some species are lost. And, and, and arguably the ecosystem is, some people argue permanently altered in many patients, even, after, even when they're healthy in just a single course of antibiotics. And this has only been teased out when we switch to better technology with, with the um, capacity to notice these changes and to deceive species we didn't even know existed before because we couldn't grow them in test tubes. Mm -hmm. okay, let's, let's deep dive into some of this, this, I guess, the genera, the species, the phyla. So if we start at the, the very top, the two most common ones, Famiculies and Bacteroidides. So, are you able to give us a quick you know, bit of information on what these two follow are all yeah, about? They, they, they certainly make up the, the bulk of the bacterial species within, or genera within someone's gut, will be from within those two phyla. But just because they're in, they're in the phyla together, it doesn't mean they have actually much in common. That's, that's perhaps one of the biggest things to point out because, you know. The phyla that humans are in also has, you know, um, like lizards and fish. <laughs> yeah, so we do have some things in common, but we're actually quite different at the same time. So I think it can be problematic in some ways trying to make too much um, generalizations or interpretations around phyla level data, except for, in my opinion, when it comes to proteobacteria, uh, because all, all proteobacteria, which is another phyla that most people have in much smaller amounts, thankfully, than Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes. Um, all proteobacteria ha share uh, a structural component that they're composed of called uh, lipopolysaccharide or endotoxin. All of them, it's just part of the, their, their makeup. Um, it's not like, and we call it endotoxin because it does have toxic like of uh, effects. Um, it's not like it secretes it to make us ill, it's just part of its structural makeup. And all of them within that category have got that. And we, there's a bunch of research that's come out from 2006 onwards that have highlighted the pro-inflammatory role of this endotoxin that's released on a, on a daily basis by, by your gut bacteria. Because as they die, they, they sort of, that endotoxin gets released into your gut and then some of it gets absorbed. And some people will very, very, very much as to how much proteobacteria they have in their gut. And you could have one person that has 0.5 5% proteobacteria, which is probably the lowest I've seen in practice. And I've seen other people that were 25% proteobacteria in their gut. And that is huge. And just think of all that. You've got 25% of your gut bacteria, which is, you know, trillions of bacteria are, are filled with this endotoxin that's a pro-inflammatory compound, which we now know that even when your gut is intact and healthy, we're absorbing and getting some in. But when you have more of it, more gets in and it has a capacity to actually damage the gut as well. So I think from a, the, from a phyla perspective, it's really proteobacteria to me is, is the biggest thing I look at there. And, and yes, bacteroidetes I look at too, because it also contains uh, all the organisms within that, that phylum do contain uh, endotoxin, but it's not nowhere near as pro-inflammatory as proteobacteria mm. endotoxin. So, but, but that said, if you have someone who's 25% proteobacteria and you know 65% 
bacteroidetes. It's like, whoa, you know, that's a lot of gram negative bacteria, a lot of endotoxin floating around in their gut, um, and which is going to not just stay in their gut, but go into their, their bloodstream and cause a whole range of inflammatory reactions. And I think it, it just depends on the person as to how that, that can manifest. But we know that these, this is a key driver for you know, metabolic syndrome, uh, type 2 diabetes, fatty liver, um, you know, even anxiety, depression are being linked with this endotoxin loading now yeah. and um, Alzheimer's disease, just to name a few. Mm -hmm. And say, say someone comes up with a high level of proto-bacteria, what steps can they actually take to address this high level, to, to lower those levels? L luck, I mean, you would normally, that would be the first thing I look at was, is, is the file level, then I'd, look, I'd dig a bit deeper into the, the genera. Okay, what, what genera of, of proteobacteria have you got? And that can dictate to some degree um, the best interventions because most proteobacteria as a class of agents are prefer growing at a more sort of neutral pH. And the clonic pH is, is immensely adjustable with dietary factors and with prebiotics. So through those taking control and we can control dietary factors, we can, we can ingest prebiotics. And as a consequence, we can actually really shift and, and acidify the colon because Essentially, we provide food for other microbes that produce short-chain fatty acids like you know, propionate and acetate and butyrate that lowers the pH, and that makes it less conducive to the growth of the vast majority of proteobacteria. And those simple things, just eating more plant foods, more fiber, taking the right prebiotics can make an immense difference to proteobacteria populations. And, and I see this on a weekly basis <laughs> in my patients because we test this, we do the interventions, we test afterwards and those levels go down and generally they feel much better because it's, it's, it is a very much a pro-inflammatory compound and um, you don't want that much floating around in your system. You will feel altered from having that much mm. floating around in your system. So if we, if we delve a little bit deeper into proteobacteria, so is it, Bilophala and Dilsalfa vibrary are the, are the ones that you're looking at? Those are, are two, and those ones are, are perhaps more significant because yes, they're proteobacteria, so they, they, they contain that sort of pro-inflammatory endotoxin, but secondly, they um, are hydrogen sulfide gas producers, and so they essentially eat um, generally sulfur compounds, and they convert that through to hydrogen sulfide gas, which is pro-inflammatory and is gut damaging at higher levels. A tiny amount your gut can deal with quite fine, but again, you can have this huge variation between having, you know, almost no hydrogen sulfide gas producers to being, you know, eight ten percent of the ecosystem, and you can just think of how much extra hydrogen sulfide gas is being produced when they're on that higher end of things. So those are certainly two of the genera that I look at, but there'll be other things like, you know, E. coli, uh, Enterobacter, Clivera, Shigella, Salmonella. Um, you know, some of the ones that we see as gut disease <laughs> agents are often in that proteobacteria category. Klebsiella would be other ones, another ones in the category too. In, in terms of the, I guess, the methane producers, are you also looking at the archaea, something like M. smithii? Yeah, yeah. So Methanobrevibacter smithii would certainly be on my radar too. And we'd be looking at... Um, whether it's, it shows up in the test and what, what percentage it shows up in the test. And to be honest, as, as a clinician, I actually find the breath testing um, is a more accurate way of assessing for, for methane status because you do get some people. I mean, everybody, everyone in my patient where they've shown up with high methanobrevibacter have shown up as a high methane producer on, on gas testing too. But I've had patients that have showed up on a gas test but didn't show up um, with, with detectable levels of methanobrevibacter on, on, on stool. So there was, there was a relatively small amount in that, that stool sample. So I think breath testing is a more reliable way of ascertaining someone's status. But when it's high, then that is usually correlated with, with slower gut transit time and or constipation. Right. And we'll, we'll talk about like the, pro, the pre and probiotics in, in depth down the track, but in terms of intervention with a prebiotic, or specifically these, I guess these negative species or pathobiont species that you're talking about, is there any recommended prebiotics that people might want to consider if they have high levels of these bacteria? Yeah, certainly when it comes to Methanobrevibacter smithii, that the ingestion of partially hydrolyzed guar gum, which is a, a prebiotic fiber, um, usually is, is 
results in a decrease in methane output. And it results in a normalization of stool form. So those people who are on the constipated end of things, it tends to soften the stool, allow for easier passage. And in terms as of well. a dose level? Most clinical trials are using PHGG, which I'll say for sure, it's far easier to say, um, is about one metric tablespoon, so five, six, seven grams per day would be a typical sort of dose. Now, I do work with some very sensitive patients, so sometimes we've got to start with you know, a quarter teaspoon a day for, for a while and build up, but most people can start with just that therapeutic dose, um, assuming they're, they're not in that like extreme sensitivity region. And this is also applicable for the protobacteria that you're talking about? Yeah, it does. Uh, partial hydrolyzed guar gum doesn't seem to shift the overall pH dramatically. It does up the production of butyrate specifically, and I think the butyrate and methane and bifidobacter are often um, negatively correlated, so that higher butyrate is lower methane and bifidobacter, and vice, vice versa. So I think that butyrate itself seems to inhibit the growth of, of methane and bifidobacter. Um, now, when it comes to other, like the hydrogen sulfide gas producers, it can be, I think the change in pH has to be a bit more, more dramatic than just upping the beet rate production, because I don't think PHG on its own seems to do much for those populations. But I have found that inulin FOS, um, fructal oligosaccharides, or galactal oligosaccharides, both from a, from a research perspective, can decrease numbers of those hydrogen sulfide gas producers, but also clinically, I've found it to do so with my patients too. Um, often, you've got you, we do dietary stuff too, so we don't say just take this and keep eating the same diet, because we've got to take ideally take away some of that food source. So with bilophila, it's often bile. It's a bile acid eater. That's what the name bilophila it comes from, bile loving microbe, um, and it's its population is generally very much dependent on how much fat you eat, but also what sorts of fat too, because certain types of fat, uh, dairy fat in particular, um, when we ingest it, we have to create a different sort of bile that's much higher in sulfur. And bilophila loves that sulfur rich bile and their populations can bloom as a consequence. So often you'll see people with um, higher bilophila on, on a, high fat, a high fat dairy. Diets, um, also you'll see it as a consequence of bile acid supplementation. So there'll be people out there who, who don't think they tolerate fats well when they eat it. So they say, oh, I'm gonna take some bile, ox bile as a supplement or bile acid as a supplement. And they, what they don't know is they're often feeding their bilophila. And you can have patients go, and I have had scenes with patients where it's gone from 0.05% you know, up to 5% of the ecosystem within just you know, six to eight weeks on a bile acid supplement. So it just works as a preferential food source. So I would consider bile acid supplements a bit like an anti-prebiotic and that it selectively feeds microbes that cause you harm. Um, that's not to say there isn't a time and place for them, but I think when they're overprescribed in someone that doesn't need extra bile, they're harmful. Absolutely. And what I love about what you do, Jason, is that you're not only looking at the, the research studies, but you've also got practical experience when dealing with clients. So you're looking at, I guess, stool samples and, and the resulting D DNA microbiome testing, you're making the adjustments required using probiotic supplementation, and then potentially retesting the client and seeing if there is an impact on these probiotic supplementation. So that, yeah, yeah. And how about we segue now to one of the positive ones? So, the ones like Lactobacilli, Bifidobacter, Acumantia. So, what, yeah. what's, what's the story there, Jason? Yeah, well, I think mo most people are familiar with Lactobacilli and Bifidobacteria. Um, those are the, the, the two classic ones that ten people tend to be familiar with. Um, and there's probably a couple of reasons for that. One is they were isolated you know, from, from the human guts a long time ago, over 100 years ago. So we've known about them for a long time. Lactobacilli are also the, the predominant um, fermentative organism in most fermented foods. So that would be from yogurt, sauerkraut, kimchi. Um, so a range of other indigenous ferments will generally have lactobacilli as, as dominant and species. Um, and then many of our yogurts contain bifidobacteria too, where people just call it bifidus, for example. Um, so I think that's partly why we're so familiar with, with those ones. And despite the fact that, like looking at lactobacilli, they they're actually play a very small role in 
the gas in terms of the colonic ecosystem. You know, they're immensely important for vaginal ecosystem health. They're like the dominant species in the vaginal ecosystem. But when it comes to the gut, they're often there at like, you know, between 0.01 up to 1% would be totally normal, you know. Um, but people expect it to be there in large amounts because it's the bug they know about. It's one that all the supplements contains. So therefore it should be really high in there. And it's like, no, it's actually a relatively small player. It doesn't mean it's not playing an important role, but it is a relatively small player. And then we've got bifidobacteria, uh, which is a, a bigger player in that, that you'll, you'll see it in you know, um, healthier ecosystems between like two and 5% of that, that sort of um, ecosystem composition. And, because it's there in much higher amounts, hundreds of full times bigger than lactic acidulite, it has a capacity to interact with, with you, you in a far, far bigger way. Um, and, and we know that that one's very, the genus in general is, is important for, for gut integrity. Um, you know, uh, and I often see people, because I do, you know, intestinal permeability testing for a lot of patients too, that those who have a you know, leaky gut have often will have low acromansia and low bifidobacteria or none <laughs> show up on their testing and it's like okay they're they're lacking two of the species or they're in such small amounts that that their body has evolved in relationship with to to as part of their functioning role was to help heal up a damaged gut and you can see it's gonna be much harder for that healing process to to progress forward if the key cells whose role it is to do so aren't there or they're in, you know, one hundredth the amount of what they, they should be. So for me, um, I've often seen that relationship. And on the other, other side of that is when we actually nourish acromanzia, we nourish bifidobacteria, we bring those populations back up to a healthier state, then we get an improvement in gut integrity as well. Um, so how, so how that's we, always a core, core focus. <laughs> and how, how do we increase levels of these beneficial types of bacteria in the gut? Yeah, so so essentially, it's feeding them. <laughs> that's that's the, the core aspect. So it's working out what foods these particular species eat. Um, and when it comes to to bifidobacteria, that's been <coughs> excuse me, it's been pretty well researched over the last you know twenty thirty years. But prebiotics. So we're looking at inulin FOS, um, inulin being a long chain fructo oligosaccharide, which means it's very long. Whereas oligofructose is probably the best term for a shorter chain fruit oligosaccharide. And what a lot of research does this day is it combines them together. Because <coughs> you have some bifidobacteria that like the long chain and some that like the short chain. So if you have a combination, it means you've got the best chance of feeding your indiv individual um, bifidobacteria. So I think that that combination of oligofructose enriched inulin, um, to use its proper terminology, which is very wordy, but I'll use it, um, is a fantastic prebiotic that works very well for bringing up bifidobacteria quite broadly and acromantia as well. <coughs> the other sort of key prebiotics are lactulose, and lactulose is a indigestible disaccharide um, that was originally used in, in infant formula, you know, ages ago to try to make it more like breast milk. So it was the first sort of pre prebiotic into, um, uh, inoculated infant formula, which was never followed up on until very recently once again. Um, now it tends to be using conventional medicine as a laxative, uh, because in large doses, you, you, can't, you can't break it down or digest it. Um, and if there's too much for your bacteria to eat in your gut, then it has an osmotic drawing effect, draws fluid into there, it softens your stool and, and gets, eases the passage of said stool. <coughs> but at the doses we tend to use, which would be minimum therapeutic dose is one teaspoon per day, five mils, mm -hmm. contains three of it grams of lactulose itself, and that's the minimum therapeutic dose. At that dose, you tend not to get a laxative effect, but what you do to get is a prebiotic effect. So it works very well for feeding up bifidobacteria quite broadly. Um, higher doses, I find, can bring up lactobacilli, and they also work, it also works as a food source for acromantia in most patients, but not all, and for fecalibacterium in the vast majority of patients. Mm -hmm. Fecalibacterium is a another of those species that people would be less familiar, familiar with for, for good reason, because we've only you know, realized it existed about 10 years ago or something like that. Yet it actually can make up you know, 25% of what's there in your gut. Mm -hmm. We just couldn't see it before. We didn't have the technology and tools to see that it existed. Uh, where now we see it, it's a pivotal um, health promoting species that's a key butyrate producing bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's yeah, and lactulose yeah. works on that. And so does inulin FOS, I should say, too, can also bring up fecalobacterium. And the last prebiotic is, that I'll, that I'll touch on in this category is 
galacto oligosaccharides, um, which we can find in some food sources like legumes. They'll contain stachyose or raffinose. Those uh, beet, beet, beetroot can also contain that compound too. Um, and if you're eating, you know, a cup of legumes a day, for example, or more, you'll meet that that sort of minimum therapeutic dose of of galactoligosaccharides. Otherwise, it's pretty hard to get from your diet if you're not having legumes. But you can get supplemental sources. That works very well for feeding up bifidobacteria and fecalibacterium, but generally doesn't impact acromansia or, in my experience, lactobacilli. Jason, you, you mentioned short chain fatty acids and some of these short chain fatty acid producers like fecalibacterium planitzi. So, firstly, just for someone that's never heard of short chain fatty acids, like butyrate, what do the, mm. what are these compounds? What do they actually do? And maybe talk about some of the other species that are involved in production of short chain fatty acids. Yeah, well, there's there's three main ones that that bacteria produce in your gut, and it's they do this essentially when they're fermenting fibers, um, oligosaccharides, resistant starches, even even sugars. They're producing um, short chain fatty acids and gas as a byproduct. And the three main ones that I did briefly mention before were acetate or acetic acid. Same thing you find in vinegar. You're just allowing the bacteria and you sort of create that in their own little bottle before you can buy it, where it's the same thing's happening in your gut. Um, propionate and then butyrate. And butyrate um, is generally one of the, the smaller percentages in terms of um, output, um, particularly in people eating a typical Western diet because they're generally not eating much um, to feed those butyrate producing bacteria. So the top of that list is fecalibacterium, but then we've got other ones like blotia, uh, roseburia, subdolagranulum, anaerostipes, anaerotruncus, and testinibacter are other species, um, or genera, sorry, in the gut that are key butyrate producers too. Um, and when we feed them, or we feed, feed them resistant starches, we feed them partial hydrolyzed guar gum, we, we increase the output of butyrate because we're nourishing those species who produce that as a byproduct. And butyrate is, a, is an amazing substance. And, you know, I, I was hardened to see an article published in a you know, mainstream neurology journal you know, two years ago that said, you know, the best thing we can do for brain health essentially is eat more fiber. <laughs> it's just like, whoa, <laughs> they would not have published this you know, 10, 20 years ago, but it's amazing to see that there. And it's because of this production of butyrate. And butyrate has um, gut healing properties, which are, are really important. And maybe we'll, we'll segue there first because your, your colon, your, your large intestine, Essentially, we've evolved this relationship with this relationship with this, this be these butyrate producing bacteria so much so that that seventy percent of our energy needs for our colon cells is reliant on this butyrate that's produced. If we don't produce that butyrate, we don't have the energy for those colon cells. We get some inflammation and they don't function quite right. You know, that's that's huge when you think about it. Is that we've totally reliant upon butyrate production by these bacteria to nourish cells to function properly. And if you don't have that, you don't have cells functioning properly in a whole organ in your body. I think that's, that's pretty massive to consider. Um, so most, when you only produce a little bit of butyrate, all of that will get sucked up by those but, um, colon, colonocytes, colon cells. They'll use every single drop that's produced because they need it. But when you produce more than that, you produce more than the minimum amount required for their functionality, that's when it can reach your circulation that's when you start getting the other body-wide benefits of butyrate. When that, those things include improving blood sugar regulation, improving insulin sensitivity, um, improving mitochondrial function, uh, decreasing brain inflammation, you know, um, having a whole body-wide sort of anti-inflammatory effect. It's, it's an amazing, amazing substance. And so I think it's, it's pivotal that we look after those little butyrate-producing factories in our gut and feed them and nourish them because they're there. Happy to make butyrate for you if you feed them. Um, and it's just an issue for most people is they're just not feeding them. And, and I see this time and time again when I'm doing um, uh, microbiota analysis is that there's many patients that really are following dietary approaches that are provide insufficient food source for those butyrate producing microbes. You know, and that means that there might be there at five or 10% of the overall population. Um, whereas in other people, there'll be at 50 or 60% of the population. And that, think about that again, that's huge, huge difference, huge variation in how much butyrate is produced and how much butyrate is then absorbed where you get all of its medicinal benefits. So what's your thoughts on 
they, clearly there's a food there's a food intervention that you use to to increase butyrate production. What about exogenous butyrate as a supplement? I do use it in a supplement in in certain patients, but I usually use it as a complement to um, effect, essentially fixing up the indigenous producers. That's always been my my, my core aspect is you know, you've got them there feed them and they'll make it for you it's a much cheaper process it's how we've evolved it it's like it makes more more sense but you do get patients uh, do you see some of these that that have their gut is so damaged so inflamed that they can't tolerate even the tiniest amount of intestinal gas being produced which means that they can't really go much more in terms of fiber or resistant starches or even with a generally well-tolerated prebiotic fiber like partially hydrolyzed guar gum. And thankfully, this is a small percentage of people, but I do have some of them. And that's where um, endogenous or exogenous butyrate as a supplement, I think, comes into play. And, and even potentially using, um, you know, I've had patients with very severe uh, visceral hypersensitivity in their, their rectum. So... Uh, you know, some patients severe enough that they had to do an enema every single night before they could go to sleep because just the sensation of fecal matter in their rectum was enough to cause pain and prevent them from falling asleep. So they have to like empty out the rectum every night just so they can sleep because of that. The nerves were so inflamed in that area that the, the tiniest amount of pressure was enough to cause pain. Um, and then you could use um, butyrate uh, as an enema in that situation to try to, to, to decrease that inflammation. And that's been used uh, as a therapeutic tool in ulcerative colitis. Um, research too, where, where again, that rectum area was very inflamed from the ulcerative colitis and then topical butyrate can actually help decrease that inflammation and promote healing. Wow, that, that's amazing. I've never actually heard of that before. That is gold. So in terms, let's, let's segue now on, you mentioned about people suffering from you know, digestive issues. Firstly, let's talk about, this is, this is actually, I should, should mention to the audience, there was numerous questions put forward by our community that we're so excited to, to ask Jason. So I, I wrote a list of them down. We'll try and get through as many as we can. But someone asked about the relationship of gut dust dysbiosis and brain function or, I guess, mental health. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I've got a whole, whole lecture on the connection between you know depression and and gut dysbiosis. There's, there's a lot of literature there. Um, so for some even some you know pivotal animal experiments have shown it very clearly where you can take you know poo from a depressed person, give it to to a mouse and rat, and that rat will become depressed despite no change in anything else, just from inoculating. And you can take poo from a healthy not depressed person give it to a rat they don't come depressed they're quite happy still so it's not just getting poo you know human bacteria that's the problem it's that depressed person's bacteria and it actually changed neurochemistry in the rat you know after getting that poo transplant so we know this there's this direct relationship there so um and, and i do personally see that the building data set around endotoxins um with anxiety and depression and alzheimer's um as as being people area to keep an eye on because it, it just fits ticks so many boxes because we're you know living in a day and age where our, our interventions like proton pump inhibitors for example and antibiotics often increase the, the relative proportion of proteobacteria in our gut we're eating a dietary approach for many people that there's a decent amount of proteobacteria populations that are there and there's a lack of, of gut integrity allowing more of those compounds to get through um, and endotoxins do cause brain inflammation they do change how um you know your brain neurochemistry works you know, we shunt more of the tryptophan down a different pathway. It's not made into serotonin. Uh, we can give healthy person like you or me, give you a shot of endotoxin in our arm. We get depressed. It lasts for about six hours afterwards. You know, this is very, very clear. So we know this occurs. Um, and what, what's probably been teased out since 2006 onwards is that we were, we're actually are getting little doses of endotoxin all day, every day. And some people getting more than a little. And if you're eating a dietary pattern that, is one conducive to the growth of proteobacteria, and two um, inhibits growth of you know gut healing species. You end up with this you know leaky gut, lots of proteobacteria, lots of endotoxin, lots getting through, um, and and that is arguably you know one of the, the drivers for these sort of depression and anxiety epidemics that we're that we're seeing. So James is he's got a psychology background. So James, is there any questions you want to ask around this mental health? connection between gut health? Sure. Jason, thanks. I think that's fascinating. I always had an inkling 
that are eating certain foods would kind of create like a dip in mood or just negatively impact how it felt. It's yeah. fascinating with all, all the science that's backing it up. Um, so I was just wondering, like, for, for our listeners, are there any types of diets in particular or foods you'd recommend to avoid um, so they don't experience these negative effects? Yeah, yeah, that's a, a, a good question, big question. <laughs> that um, It's such a challenging area to navigate diet, diet these days, you know, because um, there's so much information out there and so much conflicting information out there. So for me, it's a matter of going back to what the research is saying. So, you know, we, we know that saturated fats, whether that comes from, from dairy or from, a, you know, a steak or from a, um, coconut oil, we know that saturated fats increase the absorption of endotoxins. You know, they will bind to them and, and create a bit of a raft that facilitates their transmission through the gut in, into your circulation. You know, that, that's clear. So I'm very cautious around the use of, of saturated fat sources. Um, and, and essentially dietary approaches that, that have a low amounts of fiber. I think those are perhaps the, the, the key things for me is like the amount of saturated fat you're having and the amount of fiber you're not having <laughs> that are potentially very problematic because there's a few aspects to that because some of the fibers can actually bind to some of those endotoxins and help prevent them getting absorbed. But importantly, when you're eating a fiber-rich diet, you're nourishing the species that actually are, are conducive to good um, gut integrity as well. And that, again, is going to have a sort of indirect way of, of limiting absorption of those compounds. And there's some fascinating research where they can give people like a McDonald's meal and look at the amount of endotoxin that hits their bloodstream before and after. And it's like, wow, there's a massive increase in endotoxin after that McDonald's meal. But if they have some high, high fiber foods with that McDonald's meal, it nearly blocks all that endotoxin from being absorbed. It's just like, ah, even though they're still eating the crap thing, if it is lots of fiber alongside of it, that actually prevented it from occurring. So um, not that I'm suggesting we do that approach. I'm just suggesting we do both. We avoid the crap food and eat lots of fiber um, and avoid the things that are obvious triggers like the, the saturated fat. So Jason, the next question we had from our community is that how does light and sleep affect the microbiome? Yeah, so so light is. I'm not that familiar with the research around around light and microbiota. So uh, there's probably other people who can answer the question better than myself, and I'll leave it to them. But uh, f certainly, I'm familiar with some of the information around sleep, and sleep does seem to have a uh, a lack of sleep seems to be problematic for um, for from a diversity perspective. I think it was less than seven hours sleep tended to diminish your microbiota diversity. And we know that diversity is one of the, the key markers of a healthier ecosystem. Um, and there's a, a number of animal studies, I think, showing too that chronic sleep deprivation, so, so less than that, um, disrupts that ecosystem. And, and I think leads to an increase of you know, proteobacteria, once again, which is what you don't, don't really want. Um, what was fascinating, at least in one of the animal studies, is they did a, you know, a crappy Western diet um, and sleep deprivation. Um, versus a healthier diet and sleep deprivation. And the combination was atrocious, you know, because um, the lack of sleep wasn't as bad as a typical Western diet was. But you combine the two together, the changes were, were huge, substantial shifts in that ecosystem. So I, I think we have to consider, um, you know, good sleep as part of our, our gut management, good gut management strategy too. Undoubtedly. I couldn't agree more. It seems like that seems to be the norm in, a, I guess, our Western culture. Bad diet and bad sleep. And yeah, <laughs> it is. And when people get stressed, they often sleep less and eat more crap food. And you get this horrible negative cycle that, that goes on. It is horrible. So another buzzword that we hear a lot about is SIBO. And Jason, what is, what is SIBO? Well, it's small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, SIBO. And, you know, if you would have asked that, that question in the early 2000s or late 1990s, it would have been seen as a rare condition typically observed in people that, with Crohn's disease or some people that had part of their small bowel removed. And because they had a chunk of their small intestine removed, it meant that there was a bit of dysfunction. There's often a, a bit of a pocket that would sort of form there, which a bacteria would sit in and stagnate it just wouldn't flow as per usual. Um, but in the 
early to mid 2000s, um, an American researcher put forth this idea that, hey, this is actually more common. It may be the key driver of irritable bowel syndrome, which is, you know, a, quite a common gut condition. You, know, you might argue that, you know, 10 to 20% of Australians at any time point will suffer from IBS. Um, so, you know, that was a, a pretty astonishing statement at that time point. And I think we find now that it's, it's probably not quite like that. But, you know, I think you were suggesting that 84% of people with IBS had SIBO. And I think more conservative estimates when they, when they do more, more broad studies around the world, it might be, you know, 30% of, of people with IBS um, actually suffer from this overgrowth of bacteria in the small bowel. And these bacteria can come from one of, one of two areas. One is from the oral cavity down. So, so SIBO as a consequence of proton pump inhibitor use. So those people who are taking medications for, for gastric reflux, for reflux disease. Um, getting SIBO is quite common for them. And I think there, uh, there was a meta-analysis done in I guess, 2013 suggesting that people taking proton pump inhibitors, that whole class had a seven-fold increased risk of developing um, SIBO. And essentially, you think about that, you're, you've got, uh, I think it's 100 million bacteria per mil of saliva. You're swallowing a liter of saliva per day. So you're getting about 100 billion bacteria. You're swallowing on a daily basis from your oral cavity. And normally your stomach acid is there to, it, it kills the vast majority of those bacteria. But you take that away, you're having like, you know, that's often the equivalent of like 10 probiotic capsules per day just you know, from swallowing saliva of microbes that are, that are getting down there. Um, so it's not surprising that that SIBO has become far more common because the, the rate at which proton pump inhibitors are being used has has expanded dramatically over the last 20 years. I'll just pause there for so, a sec. So I did get a, I'll just I'll pause you there for a sec. I did get a question from one of our community members regarding exactly the same thing you're talking about with the large amount of bacteria in the mouth. Is there a place for a mouth probiotic? There there totally is. Um, and there are research teams developing that now, and there's a few in the marketplace, mostly in North America and probably Europe. Australia is a bit behind in certain areas, and this would be one of them. Um, and most of it's been looking at, at gum disease and dental caries so far, which are good areas to research, but they might expand a bit more on that. I mean, I think for someone that's trying, that needs to be on a proton pump inhibitor, and I you know, and, and the research tells us that actually a decent proportion of people who are taking it actually don't need to be on them. So it's always worthwhile. They have to check in with their, their provider of whether they need to still be on that medication. Maybe it was appropriate two years ago or two months ago, but it's not needed now. Um, but those who do need to be on it, that the ingestion of a particular probiotic strain, the lactose reuteride DSM17938, very catchy name, also known as the BioGaia strain, there's a fun, very cool study published, I think it was last year, showing that, um, maybe it was even this year, <laughs> my sense of time has gone with that, but very recently anyway, in the big scheme of things, that, you know, when people took this instead of a placebo, it reduced the rate of, of SIBO um, occurrence dramatically when they had to take proton pump inhibitors. It was a dramatic decrease from taking, you know, 10 drops per day of this particular probiotic. So, um, whereas we have research with other probiotics showing that they didn't work, so it's not like all probiotics will be helpful, but that one in particular does seem to be effective to prevent the development of SIBO. So, so for someone that has to be on a PPI, I think that's a bit of a must go alongside that. We do jump around a lot in this podcast, but before we say <laughs> Yeah, fair enough. It's one of the, you know, yeah, they all flow on to different areas. That's fair enough. Exactly. And before we jump into probiotics, which you perfectly segued into, I wanted to talk about something in, that I find interesting that's popping into my radar, which is helminthic therapy. So the use of worms to treat gut dysfunction. And what's your thoughts on that, Jason? I think it's an interesting idea. Um, and to be frank, I, I'm not totally familiar with the overall area. I, I'm familiar with some of the research that was done on helminths for um, celiac disease, for example. And the results, I think, were, were, were quite disappointing. Um, so, so there might be some indications where the theoretical evidence or theoretical rationale manifests with good clinical trials as a useful treatment approach. Um, I, I mean, I kind of like the thinking that you know, we've evolved with you. We've normally had parasites there. So maybe, you know, something is dysfunctional in our system and we don't have them anymore. I mean, I can relate to that underlying theoretical um, 
rationale for their use. Uh, but certainly when I read the research of using the, the American hookworm, Necator americanus, in CVAC disease, it was, it was quite disappointing. It was like it caused a lot of pain and discomfort and it slightly decreased inflammatory load after a dose of gluten. It's like, well, that's not all that helpful. Thanks very much. Um, you know, if it totally prevented the damage caused by gluten, then maybe it's worth it for those people who really miss their, their croissant or their damages or their slice of sourdough bread. But um, in this case, it was just slightly limited the damage that was caused, but certainly, but you still got, you know, weeks worth of horrible symptoms from ingesting the worms in the first place. So I don't think it was worth it, but there might be other areas where the research has, has evolved beyond that that I'm not familiar with. And continuing on that train of thought. So, Let's, let's talk about parasites. Are they a real problem? Something like blasto, you know, a lot of people focus heavily on parasite elimination. What's your thoughts on that? I think it really depends on the, the microbe in question and, you know, something like Giardia. Yeah. Like if someone presents to my clinic with, with Giardia, I do use these herbs and probiotics, et cetera, to, to eradicate the, the bug because it, it does cause massive malabsorption in the small bowel, um, potential nutritional deficiencies uh, longer term, but certainly a lot of symptoms in the short term. And you know, so so yes, I think Giardia is one that you yeah you would get rid of. Um, but I think you, you have a range of others, and and I think this is an area where clinicians are behind the times in some areas um, versus what the research is saying when it comes to what what's a normal like we normally have protozoal organisms in our gut they're normal <laughs> you know um and it's only because we're using dna that we can now see that they're there and we're still trying to define what the normal amounts are in normal species and that's ongoing now so um but i but i think there's a lot of those clinicians out there that that go in really heavy handed to try to kill off these things that there are, are the research scientists that they're saying this is actually normal species and, and I would include things like Dianthamoeba fragilis and Blastocystis hominis in those categories so there's been a number of recent research studies that come out of Europe showing that these things are normal and they probably play pivotal roles in the healthy ecosystem you know some people are arguing that they are the apex predator that they eat some of the blastocystis eats bacteria. And if, if you take that apex predator out of an ecosystem, there's consequences, which is overgrowth of certain bacterial species. You know, and I think it's just fascinating. And, and from, a, from a research perspective and looking at an ecology perspective, it's like taking the wolves out of Yellowstone National Park or taking sharks out of ecosystems. There are consequences. And people are arguing the same thing with, with gut too. So I just feel, I think, for those people that, went way out of their way taking you know quadruple antibiotic cocktails intercolonically and orally to try to kill off these things that um, often have limited evidence of causing harm in the first place and and called irrevocable ir ir damage to their bacterial components of their ecosystem as a consequence of that approach you know to kill off something that may have actually been playing a, a role that, to keeping them healthy in the, in, uh, which i think very few clinicians are familiar with that more um research that's come over the last couple of years looking at the, the role of commensal protozoal organisms in the gut. Same with the microbiome too. It's like, mm. I'm not that familiar with the microbiome. It's a relatively new area of research, but we're supposed to have fungi in our gut. Yes. This is normal. And if you just go killing it all off, there are consequences to that. Do we know them all yet? No, because we're really, you know, just teasing out what these species are and the, the sort of web-like effects of, of their interaction with other bacterial species there, you know? Um, so there's some, Oh, you know, I think it was an animal study, but they gave them, you know, one of those uh, antifungal agents and yes, it killed off and damaged and changed the microbiome quite dramatically. Some species went up, some species went down, depending on what they were susceptible to, but also it actually changed the bacterial composition indirectly because of all those sort of interactions between different species. And that was like a... a unexpected consequence uh, that wasn't wasn't beneficial for these particular animal models it would sort of cause this sort of dysbiotic bacterial ecosystem to develop after taking this sort of oral antifungal so it's 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 in a similar category in my mind of going, okay where it's early days we need to be aware or try to think more about the consequences of of treatment to to kill off all the fungi in the gut or kill off all the protozoa in our gut because we don't know uh, whether this is a good move or not and the long-term consequences of that this point yeah, and the biome as well what's your thoughts on the biome 
I know almost nothing, <laughs> but it's, um, it's hard keeping up to date with the bacterial ecosystem changes and the amount of research that's coming out, mm -hmm. uh, and keeping a little bit of an eye on the, the, the microbiome and the protozoal composition. I, I'm not keeping up to date with the virus. And, and the metabolite, it's the other hot area I'd say as well. Yeah. So, Jason, let's talk about probiotics. Now, this is a Quite a controversial topic at the moment with the study coming out about the from the Weizmann Institute around antibiotics and also probiotics. So, what's your take on, I guess, the effectiveness of probiotics, and especially after a course of antibiotics? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a few things to to tease out here, and and one, it's on my agenda to to really properly critique that study because I haven't had a chance to look at every little depth of it because I, you know, see patients and teach. <laughs> These things take my priorities, so, you know, critiquing a study on, on something I might do over the summer on a, on a day off. But, um, but I think there's a few things to be teased at. One is, is extrapolation of, of the research findings. So, you know, you, you can look more broadly at that research field and you'll find there's a number of animal studies and so still mechanism finding the probiotics were helpful. Yeah. Did they get published in the same journal? Did they get worldwide media attention? No. <laughs> so we're like taking one study out of context going, hey, look at this. This is, this is what all probiotics must cause harm to the gut. And it slows down normal you know, redevelopment of the ecosystem post antibiotics. And, and what you, you can't do is, is say anything bar the fact that this particular preparation used in their study was not, is not appropriate for this task. Mm -hmm. That's all. You could not extrapolate that. You should not be able to extrapolate that beyond that because they only looked at one probiotic preparation. It turns out that the lactobacilli in there, in that specific preparation, secreted compounds that inhibited growth of a number of other beneficial bacteria in the gut. Is that something all lactobacilli do? No. So you can say this particular product should not be used post-antibiotic. I would totally agree with that. You know, we, we know from looking at the antibiotics and um, probiotic literature that there's some that seem to be effective and some that don't seem to do anything. Um, and it looks like there might be some that might be harmful <laughs> to take at that time. And, and again, it goes into using the ones with clinical trials of efficacy for that condition. And I'm a firm a mover or, or um, a pusher for evidence-based prescribing of probiotics. So use the ones with evidence showing that they work. You don't experiment on things that may not work. And this, I think, if anything, is a, is a clear example of, of the potential negative consequence of using one that's no research showing it works that may actually cause harm and slow down the regeneration process. Because we have other studies showing that, that actually probiotics can speed up regeneration process post-antibiotics, or importantly, reduce side effects and reduce overgrowth of, of you know, nasty potential pathogens like Clostridium difficile. So I, I, I think it was just the, the um, conclusions were, I think, far too strong for the, the type of evidence that was created and, and how it was you know, blown up on the, the everywhere. It's like mm. on new sites. It was not even just people that you normally talk about gut health. It's all these people that normally don't even know that gut health exists talking about this study that all oh, probiotics are bad, who are not familiar with the, the, the area at all. It was, it was immensely frustrating. In Absolutely. Reality. Absolutely. And I appreciate your, your take on that, on that study. And uh, hopefully we'll he hear back when you do the, the full critique of the study. But what I, what I wanted to delve into is there seems to be some group, like broad groups of probiotics. So there seems to be your bifidolacta type probiotics, then your soil-based organisms, then the yeast one, I think it's S. Blighty, you can never say it properly, and E. coli. So maybe if you could quickly talk about the difference between these different types of probiotics. In what situations would you use these probiotics and finally, should probi probiotics be used symptomatically or can they be used prophylactically? I think for certain conditions, we know their, their use is, is definitely prophylactic. So I mentioned that reuteroid DSM 17938 for the prevention of SIBO and someone who takes a PPI inhibitor. Great clinical data on that. We know if you take it, um, you know, l hormesis GG, a specific probiotic um, when you're being exposed to people who've got viral gastro, your, your reduce of developing viral gastro will go down. So I think there's very specific instances where the right probiotic will make a big difference for, from a preventive perspective, um, as well as for, for treating certain disease conditions too. Yeah. I'm, I'm just a, a proponent of, of using the right strain with the right action for the right 
right condition. And I think that means that it, it's pretty hard to make, in fact, it's impossible to make class specific recommendations of all lactose are good for this, all bifidobacteria is good for this, all soil based probiotics. So, I mean, what does that mean? Like, I've got soil in my yard that has a whole bunch of different species than the soil that's from Byron Bay or the soil that's from you know, Cambodia. They have different species in it, and, and just, it doesn't mean that they have anything in common besides the fact they like growing in soil in different different environments. Um, so, I think we can't make broad generalizations around, around that either. So, we can make Therapeutic claims when we have trials showing that they work and have a specific action. Um, and I think before that time, particularly with things like the soil based probiotics, claims and health, therapeutic claims and, and health claims came out well before there was any research or they did anything. Um, and I think that's, that's quite problematic. You know, um, I, I hear you about eating more dirt and we don't eat as much dirt as we used to. I hear that. You know, I had kids and they're out in the garden, uh, the organic garden. I'm, don't necessarily wash my veg and stuff so i get a little dirt too that's fine but that's quite different from concentrating up and making all these claims around it before there's good science showing that they actually have those claims just because they come from dirt um so i think we've got to be careful of making broad generalizations around um categories of of probiotics i think the reality is the research tells us that these things aren't even species no, it's not genera specific it's not species specific it's strain specific for for many applications perhaps mm. not all but for many for many it is there's a strain i 100 percent agree so strain specific and what's your thoughts on on, on doses it seems to be dose being an important factor as well yeah well i mean i i think there's been there's a bit of um, pushback from probiotic researchers on this because they're they're frustrated by the the commercial interests who are saying the higher the better the higher the better it needs to be five hundred billion. <laughs> Look at the research. <laughs> the research tells us that most of the time a billion CFU is adequate. Um, look at what was used in that exact study for that indication. They may have used a billion CFU colony forming units, so a billion organisms. They may have used hundred million, and it worked. You know, and yes, sometimes the research used 450 billion for, for VSL number three. Yes, that works. Would I, would I use that one in lower dose and expect the same effects? No. Um, but if, if Elramosis GG works at, at 1 billion, then all will use 1 billion. You know, you don't have to use more than, than what was used shown to actually work. Um, I mean, there is some research showing that there, for some indications, there is arguably a dose dependent effect. So uh, let's look at. Bifidacterium lactis HN019, which is a microbe that speeds up gut transit time. And there's one particular study where I think they gave 1 billion versus 15 billion. I'm sorry, I might be a little bit off by my numbers. Um, and the 1 billion sped up gut transit time significantly, but 15 billion sped up even more. You know, so, so in that case, I'd be like, yes, yeah, so for my patients who present with slow gut transit time and constipation, I'll generally use 15 billion because that will work better. Um, but for, for most strains, we don't have that sort of dose comparative data. And some strains, it, it's been shown that there's no difference at higher doses for certain applications. So I think we have to go beyond this higher doses better thing and just using the right dose, the right strain and the right dose trumps any theoretical considerations around the wrong strain and high amounts. Absolutely, Jason. I think the takeaway for me is that for the public, they need to be working with someone that's versed in probiotics that understands what the strains are actually doing, what sort of dosage, what sort of research study are they basing these recommendations from, rather than willy-nilly buying probiotics off the shelf and, and hoping is perhaps... Yeah, because the, th the claims on the labels don't always match what the research says. Um, okay. and, and it goes for both ways, even those that they have great research on them don't always show that research on the label and those that have no research on them will often make lots of claims on the label so you can't go by what's on the label you know and I, I i totally agree that working with a probiotic literate practitioner is essential if you want to get the most out of that tool and same with prebiotics too you know there's some people out there who think that prebiotics are fiber it's just like no, not all fibers are prebiotics. Prebiotics are selectively fermented and feed specifically on certain bacterial species. Uh, and that's immensely helpful when you're looking at an ecosystem that has a certain type of dysbiotic pattern. You want to increase Fecalibacterium and Akkermansia, then you can use the right tool to do that. But it's not just say, hey, eat more fiber. And I agree, they need to eat more fiber probably too, but it's knowing the specifics. So I think working with people, clinicians that are, that are probiotic literate and prebiotic literate and microbiota literate will actually make a big difference to your your gut health outcomes and and broadly health outcomes is what's not being connected to to um, a dysbiotic gut 
disease wise at this point in time. There's very few conditions that aren't linked to dysbiosis in the gut. So I think that you'll, you'll be well served to have someone working on that, that component of your overall health. Absolutely. And Jason, I know your time is precious and we're definitely going over time. But just if, if you wouldn't mind, just a couple more questions and we'll wrap it up. So just to finish off the, the whole prebiotic loop, we spoke in detail during the previous discussion, but is there any other prebiotics potentially aside from food sources that people could potentially consider? I mean, the ones I highlighted were the glatyl oligosaccharides or fruit oligosaccharides latulose, partially hydrolyzed gorgon. I mean, I think those would make the bulk that I use in my practice and have the best data set um, for, for definitely meeting the criteria. You, you do get other things like uh, acacia fiber, for example, that's got a couple of studies showing a, a bifidogenic quality, which means a capacity to enhance bifidobacteria populations. And I think there's a, there's a room for, for that particular supplement because it tends to be well tolerated by those um, subjects who can't tolerate much gas production, whereas inulin and FOS lactulose tend to be pretty gassy. Um, GOS less so, but acacia tummy fiber less so again, um, but it only feeds bifidobacteria. So I haven't seen it make any changes, either from a research perspective or in patients from a fecalobacterium or acromandia um, perspective. You know, whereas something like inulin FOS will we'll do all three of those ones, which is very cool. So that would, would be also in my, my list of, of therapeutic prebiotics to use. And just, um, and then the rest it's working with, with dietary components of so things like polyphenol rich foods and you know, foods that contain those prebiotic compounds and then resistant starch containing foods would be the, the core tools I would use to, to shift someone's ecosystem. And, and you can shift it hugely, dramatically within a short period of time by, by cutting out certain foods, increasing the take of certain foods, increasing prebiotics, and you can make massive shifts quickly. How about digestive enzymes? Is that something you use in your practice? I use them mostly in celiac disease patients, actually, and, and not that much outside that, um, occasionally, but celiac disease patients, because even when their small intestine um, is normal, in quotation marks, after you know the celiac is mostly cleared up and seems to be healed up, uh, looks normal on an endoscopy, they still will have lower um, brush border enzyme function. So digestive enzymes on those little you know villi in the, in the small bowel will always be hampered in celiac patients. So having extra digestive support, I think is essential for that population. And that would be long-term, like forever. Um, but I, I don't use them hugely in practice outside that. Hydrochloric acid? I think it is over-prescribed. Um, and I think it's it's to do with a extremely unsubstantiated theory. <laughs> when you look at the research data that, that you know, reflux disease is caused by hyperchloridria. Um, and it's, this is a project I have my, my um, group of students in the U.S. do a, a research search on the, the data around low hydrochloric acid being common in, in GERD patients, so reflux disease patients. And their task is to find any research study that actually finds that's the case. And every single year they come back saying, we couldn't find anything. The medical literature says that people with GERD have normal levels of gastric acid or relatively higher than healthy controls, not less. Um, so I think there's a, a, in that functional medicine community, there's a lot of misunderstanding around the prevalence of hypochloridria, um, so which means it's often over, overused as a, as a tool. And I have had occasions where it's actually caused um, not only just worsening pain, um, but actually uh, ulcerations of people's esophagus as well when they were taking it when they did not need to be taking it because I read on the blog that they should be taking it. So I'm cautious around it's used because you can't rely on the fact it doesn't cause you burning pain, that it's not causing you damage. That's one thing is clear from the reflux literature that you can have severely ulcerated esophageal mucosa, but no pain. And you have people that have pain and have, have very little damage or none, no apparent damage to their esophageal mucosa. So we can't just rely on the lack of pain that is not causing you tissue damage. So that doesn't mean I never use them, but I almost never <laughs> use hydrochloric acid. A couple of final rapid fire questions for you, Jason. What, what's exciting you at the moment in terms of the research, gut health? What's the first thing that comes to mind? Uh, I just think the link between the microbiota and everything. <laughs> it's a very broad, exciting area, but I do find it. It just it goes back to us with some you know I'm a, a naturopathic clinician, and we've talked about the importance of gut health, and there's naturopaths talking about you know 
optimizing gut bacteria back in the early 1900s. You know, so that's an older concept for us. And you know, speaking with naturopaths who were trained in the 80s, that was part of their training, talking about dysbiosis and gut bacteria. And we didn't necessarily have the, the right, the best knowledge of what tools to use as we do now, but it's always been part of that thinking of that gut is the root of, of, of ill health. And if that's functioning right, and the ecosystem is not that healthy, there are consequences. And I think I just love the fact that that's being shown so clearly in the research that's come out of the last you know, 15, 20 years and continuing to come out every single day. Absolutely. It's, it's such an exciting time for people in this space with an interest in gut health. Yeah. And if you could, you know, for, for our listeners, if there's one thing that they could do to improve their gut health, if you could just pick the one thing, what would it be? Eat more colorful plant foods. <laughs> great. I love that. Yeah. I love that. That's a, that's a great way to, to end this amazing discussion, Jason. I am so grateful for you giving up your time to, to spend this morning with us to record the podcast. And I will link to you on in the show notes if people want to connect with you. You want to quickly maybe let people know how to connect if they want to connect. Uh, yeah, so I've got a website called the Probiotic Advisor that is all about evidence-based prescribing of, of probiotics. It's geared mostly for clinicians, but I do have a, a teaching um, course, online course portal too that's connected to that, that we've got courses for the general public about microbiome health and for, for practitioners to, to um, upskill in the, the ever-expanding, challenging area to navigate that is that is gut microbiome health. Absolutely. Jason, thank you so much. And you have yourself a great day. Ah, you're welcome. It's great chatting, actually. I got totally into it, even though I'm feeling a bit sick. It was all good. Awesome. Thanks, Jason. Thank you.